praise team for just getting us in the proper mood, the proper spirit. I hope that you, you're sitting there feeling the spirit of God uh, moving among us and through us. I just pray that as we gather this morning, uh, you feel that God has called you here for a special purpose and a special calling upon your life. Something is, needs to be spoken into your life about where you are and the path that you're on. Let us open with just a, a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for being with us in both song and prayer and praise. But Father, lead us. For oftentimes we get lost and confused and we need to find a better way. We are joined together to just thank you that you never leave us or abandon us and no matter where we are, you are constantly calling to us, inviting us home. Help us, Father, we pray. Give us courage and strength to hear your word and to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're starting um, a new series for the next couple of weeks. We're gonna be talking about the stories that Jesus told. Because oftentimes Jesus wants to tell us about this kingdom of God that is outside of our normal expectations. It's totally different than anything that you've ever experienced before and he's, he's trying to relay this to us about what it's really like. And oftentimes we love stories. Do you love to, to hear stories? Does it help you to understand complex uh, issues a lot better if you can get it in terms of a story? Well, some stories are really good and they're very memorable and they'll stick with you and they'll help you process where you are. Other stories, maybe not so much. There's a story that I remember from a long time ago is about a, a youth pastor that had their group together and they're trying to think about how am I gonna talk to a bunch of youth about the wages of sin, what sin does. And so the youth pastor was thinking about something and finally came up and said, I've got it. He said, sin is like what happens to the bottom of a ship. I said, in the old days, when tall sailing ships would go across the Atlantic, as they would sail across, these little crustaceans would attach to the bottom of the ship, and they would grow over time, and they would, they would form these hard outer shells, and they were called barnacles. Have you ever heard of barnacles? They said after a while, the ships would slow down because they had all this extra weight on them. They had these things that were dragging through the water, so the ships were not nearly as fast as they could be. Um, they were not as stable because of all this extra weight. It was just, it threw the ships off their normal balance. They said, but it always happened below the surface, places that you couldn't see. And so the youth pastor said, sin is like barnacles that are underneath ships. So he looked at the youth and he said, so tell me, how many of you have barnacles on your bottoms this morning? <laughs> well, all of a sudden, all of the story that he was gonna tell about sin kind of went right out the window as all of the kids started looking at one another, wondering what was on their bottoms. So we were thinking about stories, stories that Jesus told, and I'm not, um, I'm not against using any of the examples of other stories, other, other examples to help us to get to a deeper place. Uh, and we're going to be talking, looking at a different story that you're very familiar with. It was the story that we started kind of last week with Disney, and we're going to continue it this week because we're going to go into a deeper, uh, deeper place this morning. And we're talking about parables. Parables are different from legends, from fables, or from myths. There are, there are four different types of stories that we often hear. Parables are earthly stories that have a deep spiritual implication or spiritual means. They help us understand what's happening at a deeper level, what's going on behind the scenes. Even in our own life, there are stories that help us to see what's going on, if you will, behind the veil of spirituality, help us to see what's influencing us and some of the things that are happening. We're gonna talk about some parables that are happening in our own lives. So we're gonna start by showing a video clip and, and pay attention to this, because this is gonna form the foundation of everything we talk about from here on out. That's a powerful video if you kind of kind of get into the story. The, the great thing about the, the story of the Lion King or the movie is you, you already know the, the backstory. You understand what's happening prior to this event. We recognize that Simba is, is born into a royal family. The, the concept of using lions, lions are, are symbols for, for a regal life, that sense of nobility, that sense of purpose. Lions are usually considered the, the leaders of, of an organization. 
Simba is born into that, that lifestyle. That's what he was called to do. And, and you remember at the very beginning, at that moment, he's kind of held up before uh, all, of the other air, all of the other animals in the Serengeti, and, and he's kind of proclaimed, this is the heir to the throne. And, and there's that celebration, and that's what he was born into. That's, that's his destiny. But through a number of unfortunate circumstances, some, some bad choices that he's made, he, he feels that he's been forced out of the pride lands, out of his calling. He's, he's missed his calling. And, and he finally goes to the, to the plains where he meets up with two kind of odd characters, right? Timon and Pumbaa. They are natural to the prairie lands and they know how to live in that land. And, but for a lion living in there, it's just, it just doesn't make sense. And, but he begins to adopt their lifestyle. He begins to adopt their habits. And as a result, he starts learning not how to eat as, an, as a lion would eat or to live as a lion or to live out his nobility. He learns to live like everybody else around him and he starts eating grubs and worms. And it's almost comical as you watch this lion trying to figure out how I can live off like everybody else, how I can live off of grubs and worms. He's kind of given up that, that sense of his own identity and he begins to adopt to the world that is around him. We learn from this that as he begins that journey that we too kind of play into this parable that is playing out that at your birth, you, you were born, God created you for a special purpose. There was a, a moment when heaven was, was rejoicing and singing praises of what God had created the moment that you were born, the moment that you took that first breath, the moment that your parents held you in their arms and said, this is my child that I've been praying for, this is the one that I've been waiting for, and you sang, and, and as you screamed out, you were singing for joy that life had taken its full measure within you. You were singing for joy, but over time, that kind of gets off to the side. And we find that we often can get sidetracked, and we go from that moment of joy when we're just a little child of, of big dreams and big ambitions about what we were created to do, that God had a special purpose to you, to a moment in your life, you may be sitting there this morning going, in the season, I'm not sure that God even knows I exist anymore. We live just like Simba did in, in the prairie lands, I believe that we live in an age of forgetfulness. You are part of the age, of for, you've forgotten who you are. You've forgotten that royal sense of your destiny, that, that God had a creation just for you. And, and what I'm finding is, and, and this is probably hard to take, that the, with the growth and the development of the internet, when you have everything before you, you are forgetting what is most important. Because we are more distracted, because our attention span is dropping, because we have more stuff on our phones and in our minds, we have forgotten our true purpose in life. We're forgetting who we are. We're forgetting what's really important. Now, for Simba, Simba begins to, to eat grubs and worms. Now, most of you, unless you're really weird, are not eating grubs and worms, but you're digesting power and prestige and money and possessions and cars and clothes and shoes and coats and bigger houses and more toys. You are digesting on the same thing. Jesus came to his disciples and he came to those that were following and said, why in the world would you store up for yourselves treasures on this earth that moss will get in and they'll eat and rust will eventually decay, but you're not saving up for your royal home that is waiting for you. And the reason is because we've forgotten. You see, part of that parable is a reminder that you are not where you were meant to be. You are not doing what you were called to do. We are living this thing that we call the new normal. You know what the new normal is? You, you go to your job, your nine to five job, if you were to go to a, a, a dinner party, let's say you went to a, a dinner party with some friends and you're meeting some people for the first time, how would you categorize people? How do you, how do you understand who they are? Very often we'll ask, like, where do you live? You know, what section of town do you come from? Do you come from this side of the tracks or that side of the tracks? What do you do for a living? We're trying to categorize where people are because we're trying to, pin them into some background that we understand. How do we know 
where we are in our lives. If you were to ask this morning, how many of you would say that you live like Timon and Pumbaa? You know, how many of you, your, your identity, your purpose in life would be that, that simple phrase, akuna matata, right? There's no worries. Live for today. Enjoy the moment. Enjoy what you can get out of, live the good life. Live on the easy life of worms and grubs while everybody's going, but you're a lion. You, you are of regal birth. You are of noble, nobility is in your bloodline. Why are you living for a paycheck to paycheck? Why are you living for your 401k? Don't you realize you don't get to take any of that with you? Because we live in an age of forgetfulness. Albert Camus, who was a philosopher from the uh, earlier part of the, the 20th century, said, man is the only creature that refuses to be what he is. We refuse to be who we really are. You know deep down inside, have you ever asked yourself, is this all that I am? Right? There comes a point, a point in your life where you just kind of go, is, is this all that it matters? How big my checkbook is? Whether I can get a new roof on the house? Surely there's got to be more to my existence than that. We, we are in a generation that has forgotten because we're always coming out with new toys. There's always a new distraction. There's always something that allows us to not really ask those deeper questions. Well, that's exactly where Simba was. He was living in that moment of crisis. He was living in that moment of easy living. Just eat the junk that, that is being fed to you and don't ask any deep questions. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. The challenge for all of us, how many of us know whether we're lost or not? How many of you are eating grubs and worms but you really just don't know it. You don't know what your true destiny is. You don't know what your true calling is in life. Well, as the story begins to unfold, Simba would have lived out his days just living on the prairie, living like a little prairie dog and a warthog, trying to blend in with everybody else, not knowing who he is. And, and we will do the same thing. We will live out our days just trying to be like everybody else until there comes a moment where we go through a season of holy discontent there's a moment when Nala comes back from the Pride Lands. If you remember this story, she comes back and she encounters Simba and says, what are you doing? Why are you living like this? Do you not know who you are? It's, it's a moment that is a crisis of belief. I mean, you might have your story lined out saying, look, I'm going to work until retirement and I'm going to do this, but something gets in the middle of it. Something interrupts the flow of your storyline, interrupts where you are and says there is more to life than where you are now. You are just going through the motions. You're just trying to live one day after another, just getting into the routine, just going through the, the motions until something, and I believe this deeply, I believe that each one of you will have at one point in your life a crisis of belief. It comes in many different ways. The first way is it's going to come as a crisis or a collapse of your identity. All of us have a story in the back of our minds of how our lives should look to everybody else. This is who I am. This is how I dress. This is what I have. This is what I do. Until maybe there's a job loss and you're saying, but now I don't know who I am anymore. Maybe there's somebody that's going through a divorce or contemplating divorce and is going, but then who am I? If I'm not married, then who, who am I in reality? Or, or maybe it's just simple aging. You know, most of us, it's interesting, you know, as we continue to age, we find that things don't move as easily as they used to move. And we go, so who am I now? I, I used to be immortal. When I was in my 20s, I was immortal, but now things are changing. Who am I? It's a crisis of belief. There's also a crisis of meaning. Maybe you're faced with death or maybe cancer. I'm always interested, it's, it's, it's interesting to me, how many of you sitting here this morning think that you will live forever? We all know that, that death is in our future and yet when it, its head comes up above the crowd, we're, we're shocked and we're like going, why is God picking on me? Why is this happening to me? It's a crisis of meaning of your life. What is your, your true life's destiny, your, your mission? And finally, sometimes it can be a crisis of success. 
Maybe you can get everything that you've ever wanted and find out that it has no value, that it doesn't have the value that you once thought it did. I remember when I was working as a, as a chemist for, for GE, I, I noticed that oftentimes people would, would work really hard because they wanted to get a promotion, and maybe they got promoted to manager, and then you know what happened within a couple of weeks? They were eyeing the next step up. They wanted the, the next jump. What's going to happen next? You see, sometimes our dreams and our ambitions are only substitutes for something deeper. I believe that crisis is what we call rocking your world. Some of you are sitting here this morning either because your world is being rocked right now or it's about to. We gather this morning because God is trying to tell us a deeper story that is happening in our world. Tom Rainer, who writes about church growth and church planning, says, personal crisis is the single largest factor that causes most people to try church for the first time. Have you ever experienced that? Where somebody's going through a crisis of health or of their family background, and they start attending church going, God, why are you doing this? What does it all mean? What's its purpose? But then what you find is after a couple of weeks or a couple of months, once the pressure is off and they go back to the new normal, sometimes we recognize that we have to grow through these seasons of crisis. So Simba encounters Nala and says, this is not where you were supposed to be, which means that he has to start rethinking who he is. And he goes through a season of what we call redefinition. What you believe about yourself, you ultimately become. And, and he goes back to that, that well, he goes back to that water, goes back to that baptismal water and hears that voice from his father, right? The clouds begin to open up and he says, Simba, you are more than what you have become. There's more to your life than what you have. Whether you, you have a job or you don't have a job, there is more to who you are. You are, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You have the spark of the divine at the creation. God said he put his image on each and every one of you. You are not just a person going through the flow of time. You are a divine creation for this moment. We have to believe that. We have to leave the, the prairie lands and begin to claim our heritage. But in any given moment, you are given a choice and Simba is given a choice. At any given moment, you are given a choice whether you're going to move forward and, and grow into your new calling or whether you'll just simply slip back into the old habits. Safety, the predictability. Simba could have easily said, well, that was kind of cool, but it's so much easier living on grubs and worms. I know how to live on grubs and worms. I know how to live that, that simple life, but not his true life, the one that he was given. As the clouds open up, we hear this dialogue that happens with Simba and, and his father, Mufasa. Mufasa reminds him, he said, Simba, you have forgotten who you are, and so you have forgotten me. He actually starts by saying, you have forgotten me, Simba. You've forgotten your, your, your spirit. You've forgotten your soul. You've forgotten me as, as the God above. And he said, no, I couldn't forget. He said, when you have forgotten your power, when you have forgotten your destiny, you've forgotten me. When you've forgotten why I created you, then you've forgotten the creator as well. Now, if we want to recapture that idea of who we really are, he goes back and he tells them, he said, Simba, look inside yourself. Search your soul, search your heart, listen to your heart, and when you start listening, you will find me there. We live in a very noisy culture that is dominated by technology, and, and we can almost not tolerate anymore the silence. I often talk about this, and I've mentioned this before, that whenever I used to go to, to the basketball games, the South basketball games, whenever the basketball game is playing, people are intent, they're watching the game, it's, it's consuming their attention. But as soon as the buzzer and the teams run off to the, to the locker room, what happens? Everybody pulls out a phone. And they start looking at the phone because we cannot tolerate that time of just silence, of listening. This is a beautiful the Sunday, mor Sunday after morning. We're still morning. St Sunday morning. Humidity's low. The sun is out. Spend a little quiet time and just say, God, who am I? Are, are you pleased with the path that I'm on? Is this the destiny that you had in store for me? 
Go through a little bit of time of saying, remember who you are, remember why you were created, remember that you are not a mistake in the flow of time, that God knows where you are and the thoughts of your hearts. And then go through and accept your destiny. Simba had a personal one-on-one -on -one encounter with the divine. He encountered his beginning. He encountered who he, who he was and what his destiny was really all about. The mission of the church as we gather on Sunday morning is to remind you who you are because it is so easy for you to get waylaid by other voices, other backgrounds, the easier way of life. It's so easy to forget that you are of royal birth. And so what happens? He has to then go through an intentional rewrite. His story has to go back. It wasn't just over, but he now knew that he had to go back and he had to start over. He had to go back and begin again to reclaim his heritage, to learn who he really was. As we talk about discipleship, discipleship is simply you learning who you are, learning your story. These are your people. This is your heritage. It tells you where you come from, why you're here, what's the right thing to do, and especially where are you going? What does the kingdom of God look like? When we make a confession to who God is, when we make a confession of who Jesus is, we are claiming for ourselves that I was made for more, that I'm part of God's kingdom, I'm part of God's ambassador for the new kingdom that is coming. As we accept baptism, it is, is an acceptance of your Jesus story, Jesus in my life and Jesus through my life to transform the world. And then when we come for communion, it's a time to remember your Jesus story. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul talks about communion. And, and he says, you know, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took that loaf of bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. He gave it to you and me and he said, remember, as often as you take this bread, remember me. Because when you remember me, you remember your story. You remember why you're here. You remember your calling upon your life. You remember what it's all really all about. That's what we're all about. We have all lost our story. We've all forgotten who we are. We got waylaid. We, we, we took the easier path when it would have been harder to, to follow and do the right thing. We're here because of unfortunate circumstances. But God is calling us back, always calling us, always inviting us into that deeper story. I love this quote, and I've used it several times from Augustine. He said, and now, with God's help, I shall become myself. As you sit there this morning, you are not yourself. You are a work in progress. You are being transformed into the full image of Christ. God sees in you the image of Christ that is possible, the perfection of his love being poured out through you. It's a parable about the journey from just going through the motions, just getting by, to a new claiming of I am of royal and of noble birth. I'd like to read you another story that you're probably much more familiar with, and I want you to see if you can see the similarities between them. And then he said to them, there once was a man who had two sons, and, and the, youngest said, the younger said to his father, Father, I want right now what's coming to me. So the father divided the property between them, and it wasn't long before the younger son packed his bags and he left for a distant country. There, undisciplined and dissipated, he wasted everything he had. He had gone through all of his money, there was a bad famine all through that country, and he began to hurt. He signed on with a citizen there who assigned him to his fields to, stop the, to, to slop the pigs. He was so hungry that he would have eaten the corn cobs in the pig's slop, but no one would give him anything. That brought him to his senses, I can tell you. He said, all those farmhands working for my father Sit down to three meals a day, and I'm starving to death. I'm going to go back to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against God, and I've sinned before you, and I don't deserve to be called your son. Take me on as a hired hand. And he got up, and he went home to his father. You know this story. It's the, the story of the prodigal son, but I wondered if you can understand that 
The younger son, through unfortunate circumstances, goes off to a far country to live the good life, to live like everybody else until there is a crisis of belief and that system no longer works. And he hears a voice, remember, I remember my father's home. I remember what's possible. I remember that my father is loving and I will go back. And he makes that confession and he begins that journey. Maybe we need to reclaim that as well. We need to not look just for heaven, but to learn who we are in this world as well. I like this quote by David um, Hunt. He said, the choice that we face as we live here is not as many imagine between heaven and hell. Rather, it is a choice between heaven and this world, the easy life, the convenience. He said, even a fool would exchange hell for heaven. He said, but only a wise person would exchange this world for heaven. Have you become so comfortable in this world, in this pattern of this world, that you've given up your true destiny? I believe that at the end of all time, God will honor your decision. If you choose this life, then you will live as a, on the grubs and worms that you've grown accustomed to. But if you leave that behind and you're willing to take the journey, then you take on that royal heritage. You take on that new destiny. You become what you were created to be. The challenge for many of us is believing that there is goodness within us, that we are special, that there's something that God honors within all of us. The last thing that I wanted to talk about is in the very creation of all things, when God was walking with Adam and Eve, you know the story, and, and Adam and Eve had taken the apple and it changed them, and, and so they're hiding from God. They've made fig leaves to cover them, and they're hiding, and as God walks through the, the cool of the day, they're hiding from God. They're hiding away, not in fellowship, and he asks them one simple question, and I believe that he's asking you this question this morning. Where are you? It isn't that God doesn't know where they are, but do you know where you are? Do you know where your path is? Do you know what the destiny God has for you? Have you grown so accustomed and so, so comfortable in the easy life that you've given up your royal heritage? We as a church want to invite you into that deeper story. Jesus was in constantly inviting. He, he said, I'm going to go out and find those that are lost because they don't know who they are anymore. We invite you into that story and invite you to experience all that God has for you as we walk together as people, as part of his kingdom. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we have gathered this morning to give thanks, to begin a new journey with you, to experience all that you have for us. We pray, Father, for those that are gathered here this morning, that they would find their true path, that they would find brothers and sisters that are learning to grow and struggle, but also becoming better. Father, we know that with Jesus, we are better people, we're better families, we're better parents, we're better friends. Help us now. Guide us. Encourage us that we can follow you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.